Good afternoon. Welcome to Remaking the Economy, Black Food Sovereignty Community Stories. I'm Steve Dubb, Senior Editor of Economic Justice here at Nonprofit Quarterly, coming to you from Boston on land historically stewarded by the Massachusetts Nation. This 90-minute webinar features five authors from last month's series on Black food sovereignty and explores the connections between food sovereignty, racial and economic justice, and community building. For this conversation, our panelists are Pastor Keith Davis of the Camden Dream Center's Technology Training School in Camden, New Jersey, Demetrius Hunter uh, from Black Farmers Hub in Raleigh and Warren County, uh, North Carolina, Julian Miller of the Ruben V. Anderson Center for Justice at Tougaloo College in Mississippi, uh, Leanne Morissette um, of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, and Brielle Wright of uh, Black Farmers Market, which operates in the cities of Raleigh and Durham in North Carolina. Uh, a few notes. First, uh, we're very excited to take your questions. We will start with our own, then get to yours. Um, pretty much uh, the last 30 minutes of the webinar, you should anticipate being for your questions. Uh, please enter your questions into the question box at the bottom of their screen. I will share as many of them with the panelists as I can. Uh, second, uh, we often get asked uh, if the slides and recording will be shared after the webinar. Uh, they will, uh, so no need to ask that in the chat, um, and you should get those uh, by Monday. Uh, one last thing, um, this webinar is free, but producing it is not. So if you like what we're doing and can support MPQ's economic justice work, please consider donating today. Um, I also encourage you to join the conversation via social media with our hashtag, Hashtag rebuild the economy. And uh, also at the end of the webinar, we will have a survey. Please take the time to complete that. And with that, I wanted to start with uh, Brielle and uh, yeah, introduce yourself and, and talk about the article that you wrote with Akeem Cheek. Hi, everyone. My name is Brielle Wright, and I am uh, affiliated with the Black Farmers Market in Raleigh and Durham. Uh, our article focused on um, Black food sovereignty and how um, the Black farmers market is, you know, building connections across the city to provide food um, to areas uh, that are definitely in need and, and building community um, through providing food. Um, we have a lot of great partnerships from Interfaith Food Shuttle to um, the YMCA, um, and we've done a lot of different, uh, had a lot of different opportunities with working with SNAP benefits um, and getting uh, some of our senior citizens into the different areas uh, to our markets providing food. So um, that's just a little bit about what the article talked about and take a look at it when you get a chance. There's a lot of great information there. Thanks so much, uh, Pastor Keith. Uh, you want to introduce yourself and talk about your article? Absolutely. And thank you so very much, Steve. Uh, at our core, which is what we drew from, the Camden Dream Center is a technology training school. And there we prepare learners living in underserved communities across the U.S. and specifically Camden, obviously, with STEM skills they will need in order to succeed in today's workforce. So our team looked at agriculture through a lens of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And it became clear to us that we could make a difference in the way that food is produced and ultimately how through technology we could innovate to improve its distribution by making healthy foods available and accessible to families in communities that we serve. And this activity will drive innovation and create STEM learning opportunities for students. Our youth that we serve in our communities will learn how to ideate these solutions and explore new applications to improve crop yields through technology. So as technologists, we saw the problem and the challenge through the lens of STEM. We call this ag STEM. 
This is where agriculture and science, technology, engineering, and math converge for social good and impact. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Um, let's see, next up, uh, Demetrius, uh, talk a little bit about your article and, and the story that you shared. Hello, everyone. Demetrius Turner coming out of Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm glad to be here. Uh, our uh, article discussed honoring our ancestors um, through Black land. And uh, my great great grandmother was a landowner. Uh, her and her husband, Hardy Sanders, which was my great great grandfather, had about 39 acres. And uh, they lived off the land. They be became a uh, business owner in the in the farm industry and uh, provided sugarcane and other types of crops. And uh, that right now is current what we're doing, me and my wife, Latanya Andrews, uh, we have about 60 acres and we're working on the same, um, same model, uh, making sure that we have uh, healthy foods growing off our land and being able to distribute it through our um, grocery store here, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a potential store in Warren County, which is desperately needed. So we're glad to be here today and um, discuss more about this topic. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Julian, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and talk about um, uh, the, the Anderson Center at uh, Tougaloo. Of course. And again, thank you, Steve, for this amazing opportunity, both for the article and to uh, do this webinar uh, to talk collectively about our phenomenal work. Uh, I'm Julian D. Miller. I'm the founding executive director of the Ruby Anderson Center for Justice, uh, as well as an assistant professor uh, at Tougaloo College. Uh, the goal of the Anderson Center, we're the first organization uh, to uh, deal with the intersection of, of poverty, education, and equity, economic justice. Uh, and racial inequity in the state with a focus on trying to build synergy amongst um, organizations who've done work in these areas in economic justice, criminal justice, equity, public health equity, and educational equity makes systemic change. And so uh, essentially that is the legacy of our founder, Ruben Anderson, who's a prodigious civil rights attorney and the first African-American Supreme Court Justice in Mississippi. Uh, so in that vein, um, uh, my we we, for our economic justice work, our central economic justice work is around food injustice and food system development. Uh, as part of my article, uh, I essentially highlighted the evolution of the food, Black food sovereignty movement in Mississippi, which uh, had its roots. Um, if you look at the civil rights area, it actually began. Um, well, of course, there have been generations of Black farmers who are experienced, don't get me wrong, some of the best farmers in the world, if I have to say. Uh, but uh, at this, during the civil rights movement, there was an effort uh, to build capacity for collective uh, farming work on corpus as an economic development strategy. Uh, you've heard the famous stories about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, as the famous civil rights activist. One of the things you don't hear about is she, uh, in order to address economic justice in Sunflower County, in impoverished Sunflower County, rural Mississippi, where she's from, she started a cooperative pig farm. And she uh, was like other activists who did, who, who, who built, who a relied on collective farming, both for economic security as well as for food insecurity. In addition to that, there was the founding of our Mississippi Association of Cooperatives, which was a cooperative, a group of uh, 10 Black farmers. Uh, that's a 50 down to 50 year old organization. And anyways, that collective work around farming evolved uh, into the work we do today around food system development, uh, beginning in the Mississippi Delta. And what I, uh, and, and work with these farms collectively again. What we did with our Delta Fresh Foods Initiative, and now where we are with our urban food system with the Anderson Center. And so the idea of it is is trying to um, build synergy in this work in order to centralize the overall local food market in Mississippi, which is about uh, six billion dollars. And again, ninety percent of that that food is imported. Like I said, we have the most. Uh, fertile soil in the world only next to the Nile, yet 90% of our food is imported, 99.99% of it is imported to the Mississippi Delta. And so the idea of it is, is trying to uh, uh, work with coalitions, this new, more so new generation of, of farmers, as well as convincing some of these older farmers of color to actually work collectively to build sustainable food systems in order to capture that market, not just to address food insecurity, uh, but also to address the economic insecurity and doing this in a way that builds work on cooperatives so we can have economic interdependence, uh, economic independence, excuse me, amongst uh, impoverished Black communities in the state. And so, but we'll talk more about that as we continue, but that was kind of the gist of the article talking about how all of this work has evolved 
And now it's just kind of putting together, you know, the work we do at the center among other organizations to put together the collective way uh, to be able to uh, effectuate systemic change in, uh, in that way. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, Leanne, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the, your article in the National Black Food and Justice Lines. Yes, thank you, Steve. I'd love to, um, and just gratitude to be in the space with uh, all of you beautiful folks doing some amazing work around the country. Um, uh, as Steve said, I'm Leanne Morissette with the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Uh, we're a coalition of Black food justice organizations and uh, farmers working collectively for food sovereignty and land justice. Um, I always like to share what that looks like in action uh, for us is taking land off the speculative market to be held in trust and stewarded by Black growers and support local food systems. It's launching the first ever agroecology center at Florida A&M University this past November. Um, FAMU, for those uh, who know, uh, we're really excited about this center as a research hub um, that will add to the capacity for legacy and emerging farmers. Um, our work is also training 200 new land stewards per year to not only grow food, but to protect and be good stewards of the land and their communities. Um, it also looks like being in partnership with organizations, much like the folks in this room, who are doing really exceptional work on the front lines of food apartheid um, in urban and rural centers uh, around the country. As far as my article is concerned, um, I wrote an introduction piece uh, to the series, and my peach touched on the work that I just shared. Um, but I kind of hope it grounds the series in sharing how we arrived at this moment, um, talking about some of the, um, the systems that have been designed um, inherently to exploit and extract, um, and how if we are strategic and move in coalition, we can create um, self-determination, uh, self-determined food systems that feed and nourish Black communities um, and other marginalized communities as well. Um, so thank you, Steve. Thank you. And that's actually a good lead into our first question, um, you know, which is and a number of you in your in your intros talked about the historical roots of, of the of the movement. Um, so, you know, how how would you characterize the movement for black food sovereignty as having developed over time? And what do you see as um, leading movement priorities in the current moment. And I figure all of you can pitch in on this one and then we'll we'll proceed from there. Um, so whoever wants to jump in first, please do so. I think I'll go. Uh, I'll, I'll take a step at it. You all can clean it up afterwards. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I think the most important thing about the Black food sovereignty movement at this point is sort of the evolution to sort of get away from sort of a capitalist mindset of farming and moving toward this idea of collectivism and creating uh, economic independence among Black communities and really building real food sovereignty to capture wealth for the upliftment and advancement of poor Black communities. Um, again, I'm from Mississippi and we have extraordinarily talented, capable, experienced Black farmers who are doing well for themselves. But what happens is they're, they're because, they, because of the difficulty in developing new markets, particularly around food security, around the individual market, among other things, they're, you know, they're, and they're not thinking of this as a mindset. They're thinking more of this as like being a thousand points of light as opposed to thinking about collectively how can we work together, sort of the capital of this market for our own communities. And so I think you're seeing a new generation of farmers and food justice advocates, these amazing people I'm so grateful to work with and partner with who have this mindset of actually taking the risk, try to develop those markets, you know, developing those markets that other farmers, you know, who are more experienced may not want to tackle, but are willing to do for the greater, for the, for the greater good, for the purpose of, of, of building, uh, of having real food sovereignty and really have economic independence, independence on communities. So we, for example, at the Anderson Center, um, we built we're the we're the only by currently the only BIPOC led food system program in the state of Mississippi. And so we um we have a farm on the campus of Tugu Historic Tugu College, which is an HBCU, amazing HBCUs is doing phenomenal work and has a, a legacy of social justice uh, and activism uh, going back to the civil rights movement. And so the manifestation of that today with economic justice work is around we built a sustainable food system on campus where our amazing, which is actually led by our Tougaloo students. And uh, we work with some adults and our Tougaloo students who are leading this work, who are making living wages doing this, 
of building this food system. And there, uh, we've already um, are, are, are have, have a, a working mm-hmm. with, uh, for example, with uh, Mississippi Food Network to provide the dress food and security, provide the food pantries. And we're looking at you know, providing for the campus. And we're working on a business plan to look at how we can provide to other local markets in order to make it sustainable. And these students will be owners of this project. They will get revenue of it as well as providing it for the college. So the idea of it is, is to take this model, this work on corporate model, around food system development led by Blacks and to be able to replicate that to for address broader economic security. And so I think what's happened is generationally, you now have, uh, you have generationally, you have those of us who are in the food justice movement that are amenable to that and deliberate about that and trying to work collectively in order to be able to uh, uh, accomplish that. Great, thanks. Um, Demetrius, uh, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Um, so there's a lot of quiet movement going on in, in Raleigh, per se, uh, with farmer collectives coming together. Um, Operation Spring Plant is one which um, provides a pretty much a, a farmer group to actually provide uh, foods throughout Raleigh, throughout uh, Warren County and other places. Um, but we all are uh, a group of people or a group of farmers that have demonstrated the work um, collectively. Um, additionally, Black Farmers Hub, uh, we are a platform for BIPOC farmers to come together and be able to have a hub for them to sell their products at our store location in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're developing um, uh, another uh, program, which is called uh, From the Soil to the Pan. And that brings along not only the farmers, but uh, nutritionists, dietitians, um, and other uh, professionals, researchers to come together to make sure that we are uh, moving along in the right strategy to, to create this food sovereignty. So it's a collective group, not only farmers, but other dietitians and, um, and aggregators such as myself coming together to make this a, a full, fully developed collaborative. Um, so we're, we're moving along in that sense. Um, yeah, moving along. Great. Great. Uh, Riella, I was going to pass it to you since you're in the share the same state, if that's okay. That's fine. Um, honestly, what everyone has said is exactly what I would have to say as well. Um, the ability to teach others and to bring so many people like our farmers, the community together to strengthen this uh, this move to say, we can provide for ourselves. Um, we can do this and we can do it well. All it takes is partnerships. Um, I'm in several different, on several different committees um, representing the Black Farmers Market and in several different groups just um, independently of that. And there are so many people, so many farmers, so many organizations across the state of North Carolina, across the world, honestly, who are, who have the same goal. And it's just closing those gaps um, and bringing us all together so that we can uh, make sure everyone eats. Um, And there's so much funding right now, um, whether it be government funding or from private investors. And they're saying, you know, we want to invest in uh, rural communities. Um, But I think there's a huge opportunity to make sure that communities of color are prepared to receive these funds, that our farmers, our coalitions, our nonprofits, that they're all ready and prepared to move forward and um, make sure that we can accomplish this goal of making sure people of color have what they need in terms of food, healthy, good quality food, that our farmers um, have the funds they need to keep growing the produce. And they know that they have buyers and they're not going to be cheated or, uh, you know, lowball for the amount of money that they've been giving for produce. So um, there's so much that's happening and the collaborations, like everyone stated, they're all, they're everywhere. Um, We, just have to move collectively with a great strategy to make sure that the goal is accomplished. Great. Um, I think I'm going to pass it up to uh, New Jersey. So that means you, Pastor Keith. 
Okay, Northeast City, inner city, urban community, in contrast to the extraordinary uh, places that my colleagues are operating in. Um, it's interesting, I've just returned spending two weeks in Egypt and took a cruise down the Nile and heard how fertile the land is and how it was once the breadbasket that fed the world. And today they lack, uh, they have to buy food because of the politics. It's interesting because some of what I heard in Egypt and Africa is very similar to what Julian alluded to. So Julian, you and I are gonna have to get circled back and I may have to fly down to Tougaloo and, and have lunch with you. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so let me say this, in the inner city, we have in our nonprofit, we've been in, uh, we've had a food pantry for 30 years and it's the same cycle. You know, same people. In fact, the faces have changed over the over the decades. And as I said, at our core, we're technologists, we're engineers, we're we're, we're a bunch of geeks, but we we're we're community centric. We're serving our community as a pastor in the city for I won't age myself, but decades. I'm concerned about the people. So when the opportunity uh, presented itself to leverage our tech background with moving our traditional food pantry into a sustainable model where we're not, we don't have this charitable model any longer, but we have a model that really is sustainable. Uh, it was a no brainer for our team. And so what we are envisioning through investments that we're currently making that uh, we'll be able to stand up a inner city, you know, on, on black top, a container that is a farm that produces fresh vegetables so that we can distribute to the folk who live in our city. And we want to have a project that demonstrates success and replicate that throughout our region and make it available to other traditional farmers and other cities in our area and connect it with healthcare uh, community. So the idea of an ecosystem becomes extremely important where, again, as a nonprofit, we're not looking for what is our singular win in this, but what is the collective impact that we can achieve by bringing partners and, and offer services that complement what we're doing here in the city of Camden. So uh, I, I'm, I'm each time I hear my colleagues speak about their work, I become even more intrigued and, and appreciative uh, that uh, we've had this opportunity to collaborate and to share what we're doing uh, uh, in this space. Great, hey, thanks. Uh, Leanne? Yeah, sure. Um, I want to echo some things that have been said as far as uh, coalition building and collectivism, just seeing that uh, around this, this space. Um, I think that's, that is our main, main priority as far as building non-extractive systems. We, we have to work together. We have to get organized. Um, in addition, I think uh, one of our uh, national priorities is the Justice for Black Farmers Act. Um, it was introduced uh, by Senator Cory Booker and uh, the Warnock's team in uh, 2020, and we're looking forward to it being reintroduced into the Farm Bill later this year. Um, and we're also thinking about climate resiliency um, as we're all uh, experiencing the, the effects of, of climate change. Um, so we're thinking about how we can support our members, our communities who are on the front lines um, of this change so that they have what they need to, to cope and to sustain their communities. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I want to go to uh, another question. Um, you know, uh, and I think I'm going to start with you, Julian, because, um, you know, it's sort of how you guys, the question is, how can a, a network of farmer co-ops develop to support Black food sovereignty, um, you know, in the Deep South, and that's where you're based. That's what, in essence, the center's trying to do. So talk about that work and how do you link the different parts of the movement together? Of course. So um, the ultimate goal, uh, again, what we're, so I began this work initially, food, overall food system work in Mississippi actually began 15 years ago. Uh, we founded an organization 
uh, called Delta Fresh Foods. I worked with a couple of those pioneer farmers I talked about in my article, uh, Dorothy Grady Scarborough, uh, who was my mentor that's where she was a nurse by trade. Uh, uh, but she uh, was one of the co-founders of an organization called Mississippi's Engaging in Greener Agriculture, which was a coalition of Black farmers in Bolivar County, in the rural delta where I'm from, that, you know, were pioneering organic farming in the 90s, you know, when it wasn't cool. You know, they uh, had farming, you know, they all were from poor rural Black families, so of course they knew how to farm, and they, you know, some of them were, even, were sharecroppers when they were younger. And so they had gotten together and understood, you know, the idea of, Thinking about this from from a lens of economic security, of economic independence, of, of addressing issues of food insecurity, and of course thinking about because by the time in the because de- they from when you're in the delta, again like you know and Leanne will know this better than anybody. Obviously, we know we've been as the the black farmers essentially have had significant land loss over time, and in the delta, particularly in the '60s, there was a huge push to mechanize farming. That essentially, if there were any, there were, which left very few farmers, black farmers especially, being able to make an income from local farming. So there was this push to try to uh, uh, focus on uh, farming, looking at organic practices, different practices to grow high yield agriculture on small plots of land, and being able to tackle markets that they otherwise wouldn't have. And so we, you know, myself and Dorothy Scarborough parlayed that into founding Delta Fresh Foods. Of course, I was, you know, a baby at the time, but from <laughs> law school, but. Uh, and so the goal was to build sustainable community food systems in the rural delta. So the goal was, we, so we did the rural model with that work. And then, of course, um, three years, well, two and a half years ago, we founded the, and the Ruben Anderson, I founded the Ruben Anderson Center for Justice uh, with Ruben Anderson and his amazing daughter, uh, Raina. And we we knew that we would make food systems the center, so the centerpiece of our economic justice work. So we began to work on the urban food system model with the work on campus. So the idea with the farm on campus work and work with the students. So the so it was really twofold in trying to, because again, we got a long way to go in this sort of building this cooperative strategy. Let me be clear about that. I want to be clear, like, oh yeah, we've been no, we're 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 in the beginning stages. We're putting it together though, but we're all we're moving in the right direction in the beginning stages. So we realized a big part of our work in both with Delta Fresh for the root food system model and now with two lag growth initiative with our urban food system model is we are trying to make it where these markets are viable. So we can get buy-in from the members of the Mississippi Association of Cooperatives and our other partners that are in, we are part of a statewide collaborative called the Food Mississippi Food Justice Collaborative. So we can begin to get buy-in from these other farmers so we can begin to actually go through the process of scaling and figuring out what markets to tackle, how to scale, how to meet these and make it sustainable. And so a big chunk of our work is we're kind of the guinea pigs in building our farm and tackling these markets to build them up. And then we're saying, look, you know, we figured out ways this can be sustainable, this can be profitable, trying to get other farms to work with us and work with us on a cooperative basis. And so it's kind of a twofold process. And so we're kind of in that process. And what we're, we're very fortunate though, you know, we've got this, we have this partnership with the food, food network, food pantry. We're working on the partnership with our cafeteria, but also we were fortunate of uh, the Anderson Center, we got, um, two grants uh, totaling uh, over a million and a half dollars to do uh, food as medicine work in the Delta. So we're gonna be working in three Mississippi Delta counties. We're, uh, we're in partnership, uh, in fact, we got a major NIH grant partnership with Tufts University uh, and Delta Health Center, which was um, um, was the first established rural community health center in the country and actually pioneered a, a 427 acre cooperative farm in the 60s and 70s to address um, food insecurity, address food as medicine. So we'll be doing a food as medicine project with them in Delta counties uh, for the purposes of providing locally grown fresh produce to address chronic illnesses. And again, with the policy goal of b- being able to make positive recommendations for Medicaid, Medicare dollars to pay for pres- pay for local locally grown fresh foods the same way it pays for prescription drugs. And so that's that's a public health equity goal, and that's our project, the Center Public Health Equity Project. But it's also developing a sustainable market, going for that developing sustainable markets to build the food system. And so that's the type of work we do on the ground, both to be able to collectively get uh, uh, greater support from farmers across the state, uh, black farmers, of course, from across the state, uh, to, to join in and build this market. Great, uh, thanks, Julian. Um, Leanne, I wanted to pass it to you. Um, and since obviously uh, you guys, in a sense, are 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 building networks, so you know how talk about that work at the sort of national scale. 
and 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 how it relates to work in the South. Yeah, um, when I when you first asked this question, I immediately thought of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, uh, which most of us are familiar with. Um, that's done tremendous work for Black farmers um, and rural communities throughout the South by providing technical assistance and legal support and, and so much more. Um, we also have a few uh, members in our network, uh, Jubilee Justice, uh, which is a rice co-op for Southern Black rice growers um, in the South, and then um, SAFON, which isn't a co-op, um, Southern African American Farmers Organic Network, but it's also providing uh, technical assistance and development support to, to farmers. Um, so kind of to what um, I feel like I learned so much when Julian uh, shared, but I, I feel like um, uh, a lot of my framing is around the um, the assistance, what uh, supporting what farmers need. Um, and so I share these uh, these models, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, um, who are collective resourcing, organizing, um, ensuring ways that Black farmers have what they need, um, because we know the history of discrimination. Um, the USDA has has owned up for it. Um, and we know more often than not, Black farmers were denied loans. Uh, we know that even as recent as 2020, when Trump issued the COVID relief, that um, only 0.1% uh, of that went to Black farmers. Um, so these networks are, are, are necessary. Uh, otherwise, our people wouldn't be, we, we, we have to feed ourselves, you know, because uh, we can't depend on the system to feed us. Um, but yeah. Great, thanks. Um, Demetrius, I thought I'd throw it to you and, and if you can talk about, um, you write about this in your article, so maybe expand on the this question of, you know, how is the movement today for Black food sovereignty uh, connected to previous generations of, of Black farmers, you know, build out those connections. Absolutely. So Grocers on Wheels is a program that is operated through our nonprofit um, it was inspired by my father who took a mule and cart uh, full of produce and from Johnston County, North Carolina to Wake County, he uh, rode the mule to provide senior citizens in our neighborhood produce. Um, I worked with him and observed uh, the food needs, the systems that were going out, the donations of um, foods from let's just say uh, grocery stores who wanted to get rid of their, their um, cakes, desserts, two day old, three day old dessert or week old desserts. And when I saw that, I knew the need was so much important to continue to work that my dad did. Um, my dad was a forerunner. He basically, um, you know, used the paper food stamps at the time to make sure that people were eating healthy. Um, he also had a, a loan system. Um, these things are similar to what Grocers on Wheels, the program is doing. Uh, we do have the EBT system. Uh, we just use the technology to provide uh, the, the SNAP benefit um, to our customers. Um, we also have a healthy benefit um, program, um, which a couple of insurance companies are operating out of right now, which uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, these type of insurance companies, they have a terminal where if you have an insurance card that have the healthy benefits plan, you can use that. So we're creating for our customers uh, food sovereignty, sovereignty with regard to ensuring that they, they, they are able to use their SNAP benefits cards, their healthy benefit cards from insurance companies. Um, we also have our, our programs that we distribute out uh, foods to um, local churches, the YMCA and places like that. So we've expanded on the work that my father is, uh, my father had did in, in the uh, late seventies up until the, the late two thousand, the early two thousands um, until he retired. Um, uh, so, so that's where we are as far as food sovereignty and, and ensuring that people have the food that they need. Thanks, Demetrius. Um, Brielle, um, maybe I can bring you in here and, and can you talk about, um, you know, how do uh, the role of, of uh, 
black farmers markets um and obviously you're at one um and they you know they they both have an economic purpose of, of providing markets for black farmers to sell food uh but they also have a, a cultural one right of, of changing mindsets and and connect and contributing to this notion of sovereignty and liberation can you speak to that Yes. Um, so if any of you are in North Carolina or you want to come down and visit, um, we have an amazing farmer's market. It's uh, It almost gives me the same feeling of attending an HBCU. Um, when you walk into uh, the Black farmer's market, whether it be in Raleigh or Durham, you have the music on Sunday mornings. We're going to get our gospel in. We're going to hear, um, you know, we'll probably do the electric slide before we leave. So, you know, just those uh, individual staples that just really tie you to what the Black community is. And it's not just music, but of course the food. To see uh, a group of vendors, uh, to see Black farmers in this space, first of all, it just... Um, I remember the first time I was a vendor at the Black Farmers Market, the line was wrapped around the, like the park. And it was like, I was like, oh my God, all of these people came to just support the community, to purchase food from people who look like them, to buy goods from people who look like them. So from the cultural aspect, it is just, a, it, it gives you that, what kind of feeling right you walk in and you're like this is where i'm supposed to be i'm at home um but we also have the opportunity to provide foods that come from home that give you that nostalgic feeling um me uh personally we grow we we provide, we make jams and jellies, right? And we do things, we make things like pickled watermelon rinds. Um, we have, uh, you can buy pickled okra, you can purchase uh, like pears. Uh, and anyone who's had canned goods from their grandmother's house or uh, my granny just passed, she was 104. So biscuits and apples or biscuits and pears, those were things that I have that I can think about. Those are foods that you will find at the Black Farmer's Market. You're going to have your peas, your snaps. You're going to have your okra, your watermelons. You're going to have um, uh, people who are doing um, like, what is it, uh, the the apple crisp. You're going to have people who are doing soaps and things that uh, come from their gardens. You've got your eggs, your purple basils, your just so many different things. And I'm probably just going on a trip of sensory memory lane, right? As I'm talking about this, but that is the feeling that you get the cultural feeling you get home, you get, this is something that if I'm trying to recreate something from my grandmother's kitchen, I'm going to be able to purchase these items at the black farmer's market and take it home and call up my grandmother or my great aunt and say, Hey, I purchased this today. Now, how do I cook it? Right. <laughs> we all also have uh, people who are there who are teaching you how to actually cook the foods that you buy. The Black Farmers Market in Raleigh has done a phenomenal job at making sure people know how to cook this food, that they know how to, that they're willing, that they can try new things. So you can, you know, come and hear, you can get recipe cards and take this home and try something new. We've also done an amazing job with partnering with like uh, the WIC um, program, SNAP programs. We're going, we're bringing in senior citizens that may not have had the opportunity to get to the grocery store early in the week so that they can actually purchase the foods that and, and they can be around a group of people. So we're not just providing food, we're providing interaction. We're providing an opportunity for community, for people to say, hey, um, you know, I give them a chance to get out of the house that week, right? Um, so we're, we're providing that transportation. We are also in the process of trying to figure out how to bring more foods to different communities. Um, so, we we're hoping that um, we can create a mobile market in the very near future so that we can start going out even further into the triangle area. But we're doing that through collaboration. This is not something we can do on our own. We are um, working with other organizations within the triangle area to say, hey, um, 
what farmers can provide these foods? Um, what can we do to, um, what areas do we need to target and pinpoint? That's our next strategy is where does this food need to go? Um, uh, and I'm also connected with other organizations like GROW in, out of Henderson, North Carolina. They are teaching farmers how to grow in high tunnels. They're pro helping connect them to USDA funding to purchase the high tunnels and getting the funding so they can pay up front so nothing comes out of the farmer's pocket. They're creating an entire farm school. I've not seen a black owned farm school, but that is what they're in the process of doing right now so that they can teach farmers how to grow in high tunnels year round and provide that, um, provide the food. I saw someone earlier talk about um, medicinal food boxes. And um, that is one of the things that they are focusing on is providing healthy foods to people so that they can eat for the, the ailments that they have. Um, Kanita Farms, uh, which is like near Rocky Mount, they're doing a phenomenal job with this too. And I'm pulling out all these names, not just the Black Farmers Market, but these are organizations who are doing exactly what we've talked about. I'm a network weaver through community food strategies. And that's my job is to connect uh, different organizations throughout the state. But Kanita Farms is doing a phenomenal job with, they've got the youth involved. They're providing, um, the youth are actually growing food. They're producing honey with bees uh, and they are feeding their, their community. They are making sure they're providing those healthy food boxes for ailments and they're doing it through the churches in the area. Um, they have seen a decrease in the number of returned patients to hospitals for um, the, the ailments that they had prior to. So they're getting their, their community healthy. Um, it's so much work that's being done in just so many different collectives across the state. And uh, it's been a really great opportunity over the last uh, couple of years to connect people with these types of um these types of opportunities. So um, the collaboration is much needed. Everyone is doing the same work, but uh, the goal now, like I said earlier, is just to bring everyone, yes, Reverend Jordan, he's great. Uh, it's really great to bring everyone together to say, hey, we're doing A, B, and C. We gotta stop um, or find a way to stop creating all of these individual efforts and just make it a collective. So it's it's, uh, it's a great journey to be on, and I'm looking forward to even more collaborations that are going to happen throughout the next couple of years. Thanks, Brielle. I think you're making a lot of the listeners uh, hungry now, but uh, that was fabulous. Um, Demetrius, and you're in, you're in North Carolina too. Anything you want to add about like, both the economics and the culture building part of this work? Absolutely. Uh, culture building is extremely important. Um, like Brill said, you know, Black Farmers Market has done an um, amazing job in that, that work. Um, as far as Black Farmers Hub is concerned, we are um, that day-to-day -day, um, place where you can get a cultural experience uh, when you come into the door. Um, we have beautiful music, a sit-down area where we can talk and discuss about uh, cooking demos, uh, people uh, just came out last week. Eat Well Exchange is an amazing um, group. They are dietitians um, that that know how to cook well, but they also know how to give nutritional value and teach our uh, customers exactly what they need to intake in their their foods. Um, so that that was very big. People enjoy, enjoyed that. They learned. They got feedback from the dietitians about their their diet. Um, but they also, uh, they were extremely surprised about the taste as well. So they're, they're getting the cultural experience, but also the health, health benefits as well. Um, on that same day, we, we actually, Black Farmers Hub had a uh, farmer's engagement where um, RTI Research Triangle Institute basically is a, a international, is a research team, um, research lead, lead leader by the name of Kibri Everett, uh, pretty much uh, are, we're working together uh, to build and understand farmers' needs and provide uh, 
the experience that they need to make sure that they understand that there's there's funding out there. Um, if there's concerns in in regards to their uh, their soil, um, NASA has partnered with Research Triangle International to make sure that they are they're uh, growing the the right foods um, to build that economy for the farmers that they need. So we're um, we're working alongside as a partner of RTI and NASA um, to to build. Uh, for the farmers to build that legacy that they need. Um, it's about four organizations that are recruiting farmers around the state of North Carolina. Um, it's great work. Um, and there's a lot of not only the, the economic building, but there is a lot of things that have kept farmers from black farmers from getting the, the funding that they need. Uh, so RTI's basically wanting to hear the voices of that so that we can get down to the bottom of why black farmers are losing so much land, how much, uh, you know, funding opportunity they're, they're not getting, being a part of. Um, these are very important things that, that are needed uh, for farmers to grow. So we're working hard to do that. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, I'll pass this to uh, pa Pastor Keith. Um, you know, uh, Obviously, Brielle and Demetrius are part of urban communities too. But you know, you're in a, you know, definitely in an urban community in, in Campton, um, and you know, talk about urban agriculture and how it can be part of a broader network that, in addition to uh, promoting healthy food, um, furthers community agency and economic self-sufficiency. I thought you talked about that, you know, powerfully in your article. So, expand on that theme if you can. I'll be happy to, and I think the unique uh, position that we have is that we are a school, and uh, while we while we are a technology school, we are a private school, and we have partnerships across the country to teach uh, the technologies that are leading to some of the most progressive, sustainable jobs uh, in the workforce. So what, what we're doing with a few of our academies is rolling in an ag STEM component in a K to 12 environment. And we're partnering uh, with our local universities who are, are great in support because of the kind of grants they're capable of making application for. And then as we're continuing to state this collective uh, impact and collaboration uh, that we've been able to build with school districts in the in the city, and uh, a K to sixteen solution that really builds a pipeline for career pathways. And we are a we represent Cisco from the curriculum perspective, and our academies are Cisco networking academies. And we're actually the support and instructor training center across the country for this program. Now, the curriculum, you can imagine this, uh, includes Internet of Things, which is really where your sprinklers and your devices and your sensors are, whether it's in a urban farm, which is a hydroponic vertical farm or traditional farming. And so what we're using is the child's interest in science, technology, mathematics, engineering, just to bring them into this whole area of coding it and growing it so that they can see before their eyes how these skills that are transferable to every any occupation can be applied in growing food, solving problems in the, in the community in which they live. And then from that perspective, they begin to understand big data, because all of this stuff we're talking about, there's a plethora of data that's being captured, how to analyze that data and make predictive projections in terms of what next year's crops will look like, what will the yield look like based upon today's reality, because that's the world that we're in. And then that opens up a whole new other spectrum of challenge, which is cybersecurity. So the vertical farming model 
incorporates all these technologies as well as traditional. And then once learned, because again, we're looking at legacy, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, engaging all the family members so that uh, our communities are sustainable. Now, uh, I'm not a traditional farmer, but when you look at some of the stats that I looked at recently, the average age of a black farmer today, without some of the great work that's being done by those of us who are part of this team is 60 years old. So again, we're thinking at how do we bring in our, our kids into this environment and make it fun, make it exciting, make it engaging. And uh, we're working with our uh, departments of ed, education to bring this ag STEM learning experience on par with other career uh, pursuits so that uh, it becomes subject of study and get credit for it, credit that will lead them into college uh, to learn more so that there are on ramps and off ramps from a career perspective. And that's how we're, we're looking at this uh, very holistically, that's, that we're looking at it from the lens, through a lens of STEM, how can we over generations impact our community, build these partnerships and as I stated in my previous comments, we partner with hospitals, healthcare centers, we partner with the people, can't solve all the problems, but if we create a broad enough ecosystem and collaborate with partners who have very specific skill sets, we believe that we can move the needle in our community. And, and that's what we're doing in Camden. And once the concept has been proven here, we'll roll it out to other communities for replication. Great, thanks. Um, really appreciate you lifting up education there. Um, I will ask, I wanna ask a question about how the um, movement for uh, black food sovereignty is linked to the movement for, for sustainability. And um, uh, I think I'm gonna pass it first to Leanne. You mentioned a little bit about um, climate justice at, in your early remarks. So I thought I'd throw it to you first and then uh, let uh, Demetrius and, and uh, Pastor Keith jump in. I'm more interested in what the, the experts have to say, but I, I will say um, Black Food Sovereignty invites us to move away from the harmful practices of big ag um, and to more regenerative practices. Um, and I would love to hear more. <laughs> All that. right. Yeah. Demetrius, you have the floor. Uh, well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm not the expert on this, but um, we have research team that is working on soil health and uh, the capacity of uh, how to create uh, a system that works well with, with farmers. Um, so NASA is pretty much uh, creating a, uh, they're creating software so that farmers can grow according to what what zone they're in and pretty much um, uh, allow the farmers to build on the soil. So, um, you know, having these conversations in um, group settings such as uh, the Black Farmers Hub, we had one last weekend where about 30 Black farmers came together and provided a um, questionnaire to ask them how they're growing their, um, in their soil, understanding the soil. The, the um, a gentleman from For Franklin County um, Cooperative Extension came out and uh, talked about how soil is depleting and what's the best way to um, regenerate, you know, the soil and um, ensure that we're growing um, with healthy, healthy soil. So um, those are the things that we're working on as a team effort in North Carolina to make sure that we're going growing on quality soil and um, you know that I, I guess that's our way of uh, you know dealing with the climate issues. Pastor Keith. 
Well, uh, for instance, as Demetrius indicated that NASA is in the process of developing some solutions, leveraging technology. So that's a great, that's a great segue. That that's what our kids do. They build solutions. They they code it and they grow it. And so rather than going outside for looking for this talent, this talent uh, is within the, this particular ecosystem because uh, this is what we're doing, but we're teaching coding from the perspective of agriculture and building, if you will, apps so that local people can just use their app to order the food so that there's little waste of time and there's efficiency in the distribution of the product. So um, when it comes to technology and leveraging it around all that we're doing, there is a place for it. And uh, as a result, um, kids can now appreciate uh, the farming and appreciate by taking ownership ownership of the solution uh, and needless to say, lower the dropout rates and improve the path into becoming scientists to really become tremendous game changers when it comes to the subject and topic that we're discussing. And if I could just say something briefly, just very, very briefly, I think that's an excellent point. I think the, the movement for sustainability is extensively linked to the movement for Black food sovereignty. And I go to the example of with the founding Mississippians engaged in greener agriculture. That group of Black farmers, because of the mechanization of farming, because of corporate agro-farming, had to try to grow you know, high-yield agriculture on small plots of land. So they had to look at regenerative practices. They had to consider soil health because especially in Mississippi of the... Um, uh, uh, the, how they, the chemicals they try to treat the land with for this large uh, corporate farming for these cash crops, you know, adversely affected the soil. So they had to be innovative in its practices in order to be able to build sustainable food systems within these communities. And so uh, uh, that's the only way, there's no other way. We can't, because again, you know, we're not, as black farmers are not uh, subject to large subsidies from USDA because again, it's not uh, your traditional cash crops. And therefore, you know, and and so again, are trying to figure out how to with the plots of land that we do have to be able to produce a uh, healthy, chemically free food uh, to also address food insecurity as, as well as public health issues as well. So there is no you, you can't have you you wouldn't have food sovereignty if you did not have uh, the use uh, of sustainable practices in order to build that. And and I I can't say that necessarily makes things harder. I think it's I think it's more so of an incentive. Uh, 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 for uh, uh, the, the Black food system movement, so it can be, uh, can, so it can address both economic security as well as public health disparity. So it can be a social enterprise by its nature, do that in an economically uh, uh, and sustainable way. As well I, said, Julian, well said. I was well, gonna said. kind of piggyback off what Julian said as well. Um, it's the educational piece is what's going to create sustainability as well, not just from a growing standpoint, the educational standpoint for people. Um, I, as I continue to be in a lot of these spaces, I realize that um, everybody didn't grow up with their granny, <laughs> right? Um, so they don't know how to one, preserve food. Uh, a lot of the children today do they know that you can can food? Do they know that you can freeze food uh, if you get it out of the garden? Um, do, do people know that if there's a, um, a fruit tree near you that you can just go, you know, if somebody's okay with it, you can go pick some fruit off this tree, cut it up and use it in your meal tomorrow. You know, um, we, a, a lot of, a lot of information is being missed. It's not being passed down um, from that educational standpoint. We are not sitting around the um, table and talking about um, what, how we're cooking the food, how to save the food. We we don't have the the families who come together anymore to kill a hog. Um, nobody is you no. Know, 
everybody had a job whenever you came to her to that stayed in a freezer for months, you know, for the entire year. But in that process, we had the conversation of, okay, this is how you clean it. This is how you, um, you know, you how you cook it. This is how you store it. Um, and it was a community effort. There were so many people who came together from um, each little town to say, we coming together to do this. And everybody took something home and everybody had a different job. We're not teaching that part to see um, sustainability. And so I think there is a huge opportunity. And I have um, last year, we in Blayton County, we hosted our Ag Community Day where we just brought people together um, with the help of um, Bread for the World, uh, grant funding from a and and we were able to bring our communities together to uh, just educate them on how do you get money from USDA to, to even start a farm? How do you uh, become part of an advocacy group to talk about the farm bill? You know, it's the those things too that create uh food sovereignty and sustainability is making sure that we have knowledge of all of the systems that that create this space. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, uh, my sister and I are really passionate about is working with the youth. And, you know, through Bread for the World, we're going to have the opportunity this year to bring together um, a few uh, students, they're going to write some uh, an offering of letters in regards to the farm bill. And then they're going to be able to possibly go to DC to talk about this with their legislators. Like, how many kids actually know that that's what you do? How many of them know about the farm bill? How many of them grew up on a farm and had the opportunity to even say, I know what the farm bill is? I didn't learn about the farm bill, even though I grew up on a farm. I didn't learn about that until I got to college. Like there was no one told me about that. And that's part of sustainability. Coming from a farming community, that's something I should know. I don't know that my family knew to tell me that. They had so many other things going on in their space that they had to, you know, they, they probably didn't think about this is something I got to be a part of, or they were kept out of rooms that, where they could advocate for the farm bill or whatever else was going on politically. So, I mean, these are the things that we've got to also get our children involved in, just again, building the village, teaching them the things that are going to, the farming aspect is important. We have to have farmers. We can't get away from you know traditional farming, but we've got to also incorporate it and look at it from a very business-minded standpoint. And every child is not going to want to go out and plant crops. They're not going to do that. They've got other gifts and talents. So how do we make sure we pour or bring in those gifts of gifts and talents to make sure that the farm is sustainable, that the community is sustained, right? At least three, two, two kids gonna want to farm, right? They like the animals, they're gonna do it, right? But the rest of them, they're gonna figure out, they're gonna fly the drones, they're gonna be the ones to possibly build your next um community building that's got all the high technology in it. Somebody's gonna be the person who stands at the gate, like you can't get in here, we don't know who you are. Like we we, we they've got different gifts and talents. So we've got to um that that's gonna be the biggest part, in my opinion with the sustainability piece. Sorry if I went on a tangent, but that, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks, Brielle. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to move to an audience question. It's actually related to some of the stuff you were talking about in terms of, you know, the importance of, of capital um, and, and obviously policy too. But, you know, so what role do you see from uh, community uh, financial institutions and initiatives have in supporting Black food sovereignty? How does building our own financial institutions put power back in the hands of land stewards? That was one audience question. There's sort of a related one about addressing the landscape that Black farmers experience with respect to equity and access to capital, and especially federal support. So uh, a lot to dive into there, and whoever wants to jump in. I'll say this, uh, I think that the, the what's important 
when it comes to sort of capital um, to support this work, I think it's important that it has to be non-traditional. I think what's going to be important to this work, it, which is really, and it's really kind of developed in the last few years, is having more uh, grant-based discretionary dollars in order to build this work from the ground up. It's not your traditional, you know, I go with head in hand and get a loan and let's not even get started on the history of USDA and that process. So that's a whole, again, whole nother panel for a whole nother day. Uh, but the, the I think now what's happened is in the last few years, again, I've been involved in this work for 15 years, but it's really been just the last maybe five or six, in my experience, that there has been a commitment from uh, granting organizations to provide discretionary funding, provide for infrastructure and for production. And now the next plateau is really going to also be for labor. You know, even though, you, you know, a food system is, is in, it, you know, we're not trying to be traditional farmers. We're actually literally trying to uh, alleviate poverty and for people, unlike slavery, where essentially, you know, the black bodies were exploited for collective wealth that built this country. We're trying to turn it back on its head. You know, now in, in building food systems, that collective wealth is to, you know, to alleviate poverty in black communities and economically empower them. And so it's so traditional capital uh, it, it would, is not sufficient. The idea is it's a matter of getting uh, granting dollars, private dollars, and then working with national partners to provide the technical assistance in order for us to be uh, to be able to scale up our work and then to be able to work collectively, uh, scale up our work individually, but also to begin to work collectively to build a broader food system. And, you know, Steve, you know, that shout out to you and thank you for, for being here, but we, we never would have been here, but for an organization, a Frontline Solutions Elevate Initiative through the Gates Foundation that worked to bring collective power amongst Black economic justice organizations and food justice organizations, and have been extraordinary in not only supporting our work by helping us leverage and get connections for grant dollars, but also to provide opportunities like these for marketing to tell our stories and to build capacity, you know, and I'm also myself and Keith are also with uh, the Food Security Equity Impact Fund, which is another group of food justice organizations that have been linked with uh, uh, food banks, uh, nationally linked to food banks as a market. They're providing that same support to scale up our work and build capacity so we can build a broader food system movement. So I think it's both uh, uh, a non-traditional capital uh, mostly through unattached discretionary grant dollars that uh, allow us to support uh, farming, production, distribution, marketing, labor, but also married to the technical sense of capacity building so we can scale this work and build the food systems locally, regionally. And then, of course, th that bring us together ultimately collectively to try to build this broader food system movement nationally. Thanks. And Leanne, I think I want to throw it to you. This is obviously a, a place that you guys involve, are involved in a lot. Yeah, I was feeling this this question. Um, I'm a little radical with my approach, and I think um, a lot of uh, funding that we have uh, received is in the non-traditional grants. Um, when corporations or partners uh, want to support the work of Black food sovereignty, my call would be to ask these institutions, though, to um, question more so how they're operating in the world um, as, as institutions. I think funding is absolutely supportive. Um, but it only goes but so far if corporations are the culprits of like food insecurity, um, displacement and environmental degradation. Um, I'd also ask corporations to consider their role in land reparations. Um, I think if corporations are going to support, right, <laughs> our work more than superficially, they have to really be creative and anti-capitalist in their approach. Um, so I think this is a this is a living question that we're in. And yeah. Um, I'd love to hear what other people have to say as well. Um, well, let me let me go on to another question that you, you can sort of, you know, because there's a lot of questions in the in both in the chat and the Q and A. So this one I'm taking out of the chat. Yeah. Please try to put the questions in the Q and A, but they're they're fantastic questions. So this one was: Is anyone drafting an alternative farm bill? Um, the comment: So much structural racism, classism, sexism is built into uh, the current bill and system. What if we start over and create a model bill for? land, food, and environmental justice. So I'm curious if that's happening and if any of you know anything about that. I'm not aware, that's an excellent idea actually, as a, as a policy proposal, sort of ideally look at what, what supports, um, what supports would be necessary for, to build a food system movement through the lens of USDA. Um, but I, we, now as part of the um, Anderson Center 2, Anderson Center 2 loop, we actually did. We did a project with the Social Disadvantaged Farmers and Well Farmers and Ranchers Policy Center, 
where we work with community economic development projects in the Delta and um, made uh, policy recommendations from the farm bill based on that. And so part, a big part of it was providing more supports for EBT and access and training for community food system development uh, to build the system up through USDA. But I think they're right. I think we're radically rethinking what that would look like, what the farm bill would look like to build a black fruit food sovereignty, sustainable food systems is something that needs to be a huge policy priority. I was going to say the same. I don't know one who's doing that, and it sounds like a great idea. But what I can say is um, I've been working with Bread for the World and different organizations in the Raleigh Durham area just to inform people about what the Farm Bill is. There's so many people who don't have any idea about the Farm Bill or what it includes. They don't know it includes SNAP benefits. They don't know it includes funding. They they just don't know. So I think that um, first, we definitely have to educate even more people um, and, and not just people involved in agriculture, but people everywhere. Like we've got to tell them what the Farm Bill is and that it even exists. I, I don't know that if I polled 10 people that five of them would know <laughs> what the farm bill is. So um, I think it's definitely important for us to educate first on that standpoint. But if you create a group to start putting together a farm bill, please call me. I'm all for it. I will be there. Um, and I look forward to sharing input. <laughs> Great. And I, I want to take a couple other questions that are policy related but at the local level. So there's a question from somebody in Maine uh, who talks about how some of their uh, food sovereignty activism has been centered around local ordinances that allow small producers to sell directly to the public without oversight from state licensing inspection. Does this intersect with your work and is it helpful or harmful to your work? So that's one question. Another about uh, the role of local food policy councils and uh, how they can support the work. So I'm on a couple of food policy councils and um, it has been very re rewarding. Um, I don't know that I knew as much about food policy before I got involved in these spaces. Um, and it really... I think this is what kind of pushed me in terms of the advocacy space, um, not realizing how much is connected to the food that we eat. Um, I don't think people realize that when, even when, you, when it comes to urban planning, right, um, and how a community is set up or where certain um, money is being spent within a community in terms of sidewalks or what grocery stores are being built. We're not at a lot of these policy meetings. <laughs> We're not, at least people of color. When I have gone to some of the um, uh, city council meetings or community meetings for whatever it may be, sometimes I'm the only person of color in the room. I'm also a part of Farm Bureau and I it, depending on the event, I could be the only black female in the room. Uh, depending on uh, what agriculture organization or workshop it might be, again, I'm going to be one of very few. Um, I didn't realize how much, mm, when I've looked at, uh, when I've seen people who have, um, lost land, that there was a situation um, where an organization helped a, a family uh, keep their uh, land from a road, a highway, major highway going through their land. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, they put a lot of money behind this. And it was a great thing, right? But would they have done the same thing for me? And um, when I saw it, I also thought this was done because people understood policy, not just food policy, but they understood policy and they were involved in community meetings. They were involved, they knew what urban planning looked like. They had somebody on the board to advocate for them. They had all of these different things happening in the background that stopped this from happening. Um, they understood the, um, gosh, what is it called? Um, oh, the 
agriculture, what is it, the agriculture districts, like they, they understood that about their communities. I had never even heard of that before. But, you know, there are things where you can set up to have your land put into, say, okay, a voluntary ag district. I, I'm part of that. So you've got to before you can bulldoze through my land, there's got to be a meeting about it. A lot of people don't know that those things exist. So um, I, the biggest thing with policy for me is that, or how it relates, food policy, urban policy, all of the above. We, One of the things I've learned is we have to be involved in these meetings. We have to understand what's taking place. We have to know people. We have to train up our children. We have to train up the, the people who we know have the, um, who could go in and represent us in an amazing way for things to, for things to happen, for uh, change to be made. So um, just in this whole food policy, policy period, we have got to educate ourselves, we have got to be intentional, and we've got to definitely strategize so that way we can see these changes happen, so that we can see um, things not just taken from us so easily. Um, I don't even have the words to articulate it, y'all, because my mental is just like, oh, it's just a lot. So um, yes, we with, I don't even know if I answered your question, but <laughs> policy is important for us all to be involved in that. And, and we've got to start with our children, the adults now, we have to be in these spaces and really be intentional about going to these different uh, types of events to voice our opinion and to be heard. And, I, and I, I, brief, I just want to briefly say that I'm on the board of the Mississippi Food Policy Council, and what we're focused on is uh, expanding the number of local policy councils. A big role is essentially um, um, community engagement and building collective. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Oh, went to commercial break. Because it's not so much that there are policies developed, like the, you know we're in the early stages of the food system development, so they're not so much policies as they're not so much policies that are that preclude it or on the local level or and of course certainly no policies essentially support it but a big part is building the collective power to push for those policies to expand the food system locally uh and and to preclude any type of of of, of, of backlash uh, to plan it, preclude, pre prevent it from expanding so at this point particularly in the work in mississippi the food uh, policy council again are used as a mechanism of community engagement and uh, uh building collective capacity Great. Um, I'm going to, another question that came from the audience um, is about partnerships and in particular partnerships with uh, healthcare. And, you know, we discussed this a little bit on this panel already, but um, particularly um, with healthcare providers and communities that um, where they're focused on preventative health education and mental health support, um, you know, aligning nutrition care with healthcare is essential to their missions. Um, how can the healthcare community contribute most to uh, Black food sovereignty efforts? Demetrius, are you trying to jump in there? Um, I can chime in on the healthy benefits program that these insurance companies are doing across the country. Um, those health benefit, uh, the beneficiaries were, are able to have a certain amount of funding each month uh, to to provide healthy foods for their families. Um, I think it's in, extremely important for uh, these insurance companies to push this out to communities that they know that have low access to food um, and also under, understand what they can get as far as uh, this beneficiary card um, and what it allows it to do for, for their families. Um, I don't know if it's out there or not in the, in the, uh, um, as far as the consumers when they're shopping, but I think it needs to be some more education pieces around these uh, benefit cards. These healthy benefits cards are very important. Um, I have people now that customers that come in and use them, um, but it needs to be out. The, the education and the marketing around it needs to be out there more. And I just say, I say, I say, ditto to that. And I stand by everything I said. Is food is medicine, but I did it, it creates a market uh, for sustainable food system. It creates the individual market for sustainable food systems, and of course, 
addresses uh, chronic illness because of the nutrient con the food the nutrient content uh, in food is greatest when it's most local. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, looking at other questions here. There. Uh, well, okay. So there was a a, 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 a request from uh, a couple um, listeners to to have uh, panelists speak on the on the racial climate and the challenges experienced by Black farmers and ranchers, and and what are the resources out there to support them. Um, I, I spoke about the the RTI Research tri Triangle is um, international, um, and their um, focus to deal with the issues of the Black farmers um, from you know past experiences with government agencies such as uh, FSA and RCS. Those agencies that have the funding, those agencies that have um, the pull to to, to ensure that um, the farm is growing or developing in the way it should, um, water quality, et cetera. Um, Research Triangle is providing uh, information for farmers and allowing them to share their, their um, inequities. Um, and hopefully at, at some point, once we get the information in from these surveys that we can um, began uh, fighting. Um, Operation Spring, Spring Plan is putting in um, uh, bills and working hard on policy um, to make these changes. Uh, Dorothy Barker is the um, executive director. She's just left DC um, working hard at these policies. So um, there's a quite a bit of, um, you know, things that farmers or these organizations, these black farmer organizations have heard um, the complaints, um, and there's a uh, fights along, there is a lot of fighting along the way. Um, and, uh, Dorothy Barker and her husband and the others that are in operation spring plant, I sit on the board there. We're, I'm um, constantly, um, looking into, um, farmers with issues and, and trying to make sure that they, they are, um, we're fighting for them. Great. Um, so there was an interesting question about the media and it's like, you know, once in a blue moon, there'll be a story on one of your, you know, initiatives. Um, what is the media missing? What is the story that's not being told that you want to lift up here? Any of you can jump in on this one. Leanne, I'm sort of looking at you because uh, this seems like something you probably thought about. I know. About. Thank you for that. And I'm trying to think about that more deeply, what the story that's not being told, um, because I think there has been a lot of amplification around the work of um, a lot of uh, organizations like the folks here in this room, uh, members of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance who are on the ground doing such really powerful work in, in food sovereignty. Um, I think what I'd like to see more of uh, amplified are the, um, hmm. I wanna say the institutions, what, what we hear a lot of is like the, the negatives. Um, even when I, when I think of my, my framing, it's always as a, in, re, in response to, but we're building something that's, um, that's regenerative, that's healing, that's, um, that's nourishing and more documenta documentation of that work, that really beautiful healing work that's happening in these communities. Because like there's logistics of it, there's um, the, I guess the community aspect is more so what I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see amplified. Um, yeah, I'll say that. Great, um, I, Julian, go ahead. I was, just in brief, I was gonna say brief, I think, and I, so, and I tried this in my article that, you know, we're not new to this space. I mean, we come from generations of of of, of black farmers who who had who did this work with a collective mindset with with black sovereignty in mind. Uh, they were just essentially uh, handicapped and essentially sabotaged. I mean, let's just be completely honest. And so, you know, we're not doing anything new. 
Uh, I think we're just more deliberate and more collective, uh, more, I think we're more deliberate about trying to uh, uh, build this as a movement uh, and doing this work uh, collectively. But I think that, it, that the experience, the work, it was, it was, it was, it's generation, it was passed down generationally. And we have the opportunity now to be in a place where we can, you know, we've overcome those because they overcame those barriers. We're not in a place where we can take it to the next level and be deliberate in building a sustainable uh, a food system. Great. Um, I would so like I to piggyback want... on that. I was just going to say, I would like to piggyback on, on that as well. Um, Frontline Solutions, um, you know, brought a lot of us in Oklahoma and Tulsa um, as a collective to um, discuss the needs and, and bring us forward, moving forward. We're here together right now to um, strengthen uh, farmers and their capacities and what, what, they're, what all of us are working on is to try to provide a, a better way of farming, a better way of um, systems. And you know, Frontline Solutions did that. They, they brought us in together. We had these discussions and um, you know, quite a bit of us are partnering together. Uh, Black Farmers Market and Black Farmers Hub is a part of the um, RTI um, movement as far as getting the issues out um, and working directly with um, the research team um, to talk to farmers. And we're going around the state to, um, you know, hear about the stories, learn from um, improving on soil health and working as a collective to do that. So. There's a lot of energy around that. And um, back in the days, you know, as um, our forefathers or foremothers were um, out there, they worked together collectively and they built str um, strong teams in the country. You know, everybody knew each other. Um, they worked together. I'd stay on the land where my, my wife's family um, of 60 acres, they're still here now and we work as a collective. So, um, you know, building that, that type of environment, even in the urban co communities, um, we need to continue to do that, um, working together. Thanks, and uh, thanks for lifting up Frontline Solutions. Again, obviously, uh, they co-sponsored that article series uh, with NPQ, so this wouldn't be happening without them. And that leads me to the last question that I'm gonna close with, which is just, you know, uh, and we don't have a lot of time, so like 30 seconds each at max, but um, name a step uh, that nonprofits or philanthropy can take uh, to, or a priority that they should be supporting in the Black food sovereignty movement. And whoever wants to jump in first. I'll go first. Um, I'll just take it back. Education, uh, making sure that our communities have the wisdom and knowledge they need to, to keep moving forward. Um, getting them hands-on experience in agriculture, getting them hands-on experience in policy, giving them hands-on experience in home ec, because we don't have that, we don't teach that in class anymore. So um, providing those types of just whatever foundational information that we can give to our communities to educate them, I think that is going to be key. And I would add, uh, often it isn't just the cash or the capital. Capital is not just cash. Sometimes leveraging the assets of these major corporations, healthcare uh, institutions, universities in our community, all of those assets can be leveraged to help scale the work that we're doing at the community level. I think in going back to what was stated, Frontline Solutions, I think is on the cutting edge of a consulting firm that's doing work that's so meaningful to us all. So I would also like to thank them publicly for their initiative and in bringing us together. But I think these large companies and, and anchor institutions in our community, if they're not just writing checks, they'll open up assets and leverage those assets to support our mission it would be a great thing to do. Thanks. Um... And uh, Demetrius, and let's let's keep these really super brief because we're we're at time, really. Uh, I would say uh, developing logistics uh, so that there is a cohesive, more cohesive relationship among farmers throughout the nation, um, and, and ensuring 
that we all know how to uh, plan and work and develop together. I think that's very important along with the educational piece. Great, Julian? I, briefly, I'll just say ditto to everything. I just say basically uh, uh, this large discretionary uh, funding to build food systems on the ground level married to uh, technical support, marketing support, uh, and collect this support to build collective capacity that Frontline Solutions has been innovating with us and Food Security Network Impact Fund is doing with us and doing at that level. And again, I think this will be transformative for the work. Leanne, I'll give you the last word. Uh, technical assistance, marketing support, what Jillian just shared, and uh, education. Always education. Great. Well, with that, uh, we had. I want to thank all the people who attended this webinar. Your your questions and the the all the comments in the chat were amazing, and tried to get to as much as we could. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Pastor Keith Davis uh, from Camden Dream Center, Demetrius Hunter from Black Farmers Hub, Julian Miller from uh, the. The Ruben V. Anderson Center for Justice at Tougaloo, Leanne Morissette from the National Blue Black Food and Justice Alliance, and Brielle Wright from uh, the Black Farmers Market. Um, uh, and uh, thanks, of course, also to Frontline Solutions, who's gotten mentioned probably here at the end about uh, for putting together this um, series and so much more. Um, and uh, look forward to... Um, Keep keep uh, paying attention to your MPQ emails. There'll be definitely many more uh, webinars in this series to come. Uh, thanks so much, everyone.